news continues. This is the night side edition of Eyewitness News 3, the latest report of tonight's news, and the first look at tomorrow, presented by Jerry Brown. Weather with Shirley Gilbert, and sports with Gene Motley. And now, Eyewitness News 3, live at 11. Good evening. Jerry Brown is recovering from storm damage of his own tonight. I'm Steve Beverly. Well, it's time to pull together even more and get our lives as close to normal as we can. And that's what Wilmington vicinity has been doing the day after Diana. This is what you may have seen and heard in your neighborhood today. A beautiful day for the buzzing of chainsaws and the loading of uh, down trees onto the roadsides. Now, this is what one family was doing on Oleander Drive in Wilmington, where nine trees fell in their yard. But a disabled man, Haskell Falk, is still trying to get a tree removed from his home on North 26th in town. Tonight, we'll continue to show you more of how our communities are cleaning up. Well, the lights are still out in some parts of New Hanover County tonight, including the Myrtle Grove uh, subdivision. Winds from Hurricane Diana blew hard through this heavily wooded section at the county's southern tip. Few yards here are without fallen trees. One resident who is still trying to clear the debris blocking his car says Diana was the worst storm he's seen. It didn't, it blowed, but we didn't have the damage that this time. Water Someone says he believes a tornado may have touched down because the damage seems to be greater here than in the surrounding areas. In Southport, CPNL will be interrupting electric service on the Southport substation this morning. The power will be off for approximately two hours. Now, if you have electricity there now, it'll go off in less than an hour around midnight and be back on at 2 a.m. The areas affected, in addition to Southport itself, will be Boiling Springs and the area along Highway 133 north of Southport. Well, for many of you who have been in evacuation centers or at home without power, food may be the last thing on your mind. But some good folks have come to the aid of many in our areas with hot meals. Lila Tivet of the Carolina News Network checks out that situation. The sounds and smells of sizzling hamburgers filled the air around Bolivia's elementary school. As fast as the volunteers could flip them, scoop them, and stuff the burgers in buns, there were eager hands waiting to take the food away. For many people, it was the first hot meal in days people like Herbert and Gloria Bryant. They said their nearby home was ringed by fallen trees and downed power lines. Our home is totally electric. We can't do anything. We don't have any hot food, anything. No hot water, no, no power hot at all? Water, no power at all. How have you been surviving? What have you been doing? Mm, just the best we could. That's all. <laughs> That's all we could do. <laughs> Were you scared? Mm, yes, I was scared. <laughs> yeah, I was scared. I was scared that the roof was coming over my head. How did you get through it? Uh, well, I, I, <laughs> I, I wasn't that stupid. Stay where I was. When the Bryants and others like them ventured out, they were welcomed here, and they came by the hundreds. A spokesman for Hardy says they served a thousand burgers in the first 30 minutes, and that was just the beginning. John Merritt says this was more than just a good public relations move for his company. We got a request from the Red Cross, and when the Red Cross asks in a uh, situation like this, you respond. It's just uh, your responsibility as a, as a corporation in the state. And it's all free, all donated. Oh, sure. I'm, you know, never question about that. And there was no question people appreciated this meal. Some chose to take the food home. Sandra Blake and her children had to carry enough for a family of eight. What do you think about the people that donated all this? We are very appreciative of them. Very. <laughs> Through it all, people said they were grateful. Grateful for the offers of help, grateful for the chance to serve, but most of all, grateful that the injuries and destruction here were not any worse. I'm Layla Tivette, reporting for the Carolina News Network. Now, some of you have been lucky enough to escape the worst of Diana's wrath. And you may be asking, how can I help someone who's going through a tough time at the moment? Now, here is a good way. The state has set up a fund to help victims of Diana. You can send your checks in whatever amount to the North Carolina Relief Fund, Post Office Box 27687, Raleigh, North Carolina. The zip, 27611. Still ahead on the Night Side Edition, we'll take a look at Diana's effect on area farmers. Dan Hester will have that report when we come back. Hey. One of the things our own Dan Hester follows on his regional North Carolina beat is how well the farmers have been doing. Tonight, Dan will tell you how the crops have survived Diana in Bladen County. They all came here today to pool resources and see just how bad the situation in Bladen County really is and to determine whether Bladen might be declared a disaster area. Bladen Extension Chairman Keith Dennis had heard reports that Bladen had been wiped out. We are not wiped out in any crop. We have had some damage, I'm sure, 
But I think with the initiative that farmers have that we will be able to get out and, and salvage a lot of this with proper management. Teams from the Extension Service and other agencies headed into the county talking with farmers and checking crops to get first-hand information. A few farmers were hit hard by the storm. Carl Smith was one of them. I would say there's a third of what was left on the stalk that's laid off. Water seemed to be the main problem, especially with peanuts. Some wind damage to corn and tobacco could be found. Until all the information is brought back here and compiled, it's still impossible to tell exactly how much crop damage there is. But preliminary reports indicate it could be as low as 10 to 20 percent. I'm Dan Hester, Eyewitness News 3 in Bladen County. The effects of Diana are lingering on a couple of our area towns. In Long Beach, there's a general curfew until 7 o'clock in the morning. Now, the mayor and city manager have ordered evacuation of the area from 58th Street West to Davis Canal South because of downed power lines and deep water. In addition, a curfew is in effect until 6 a.m. at Carolina Beach. But if you are trying to get back home tomorrow to your property, you will be allowed on. Well, tonight, people who can get to stores in our area have been picking up business but they're shopping for the essential items that they've lost during Diana. As Brian Glazer of the Carolina News Network reports, demand is far greater than supply. The demand for dry ice is incredible. Too much for Wilmington ice houses to handle. All our family. Without electricity, refrigerators are useless, and food is boiling quickly. People have come to the port city from as far away as 30 miles in hopes of buying a few precious shoes. I've got two 17-foot refrigerators down at Wilmington Beach. No power, no hope to get many. Gasoline-powered electric generators are in big demand. At this one store alone, 200 generators were sold in an hour. <coughs> Everywhere you turn, trees have fallen. A Missouri chainsaw manufacturer cuts in more than 2,000 saws. A local retailer says this has been his biggest sales day in more than 10 years. So many pine trees are down, hardwoods are down, that people desperately need them, and we've been able to fill a need. It's a good feeling. Many parts of Wilmington and other coastal communities are without drinking water. Thousands of wells have been contaminated. Thus, the rush at local stores for bottled water has been ongoing all day. While the lack of water poses a problem for some, too much water is a problem for others. Many homeowners and merchants have found their carpets soaked. There's a waiting list at many stores for people who want to rent steam cleaners. It was, uh, he had to go like three different places and it was $11. By far, the one item in demand more than any other is glass. Hundreds of coastal homes and businesses had windows knocked out, and glazing crews say it will be weeks before they're able to complete all the orders. While Hurricane Diana has caused insurmountable destruction to many businesses, it has been a boost to others, especially hotels, which in the past five days have been booked solid. So a goodbye to Diana means a farewell to an unforeseen economic boom. I'm Brian Glazier reporting for the Carolina News Network. Well, surely the other business people are already out. Here's one of the first. It says, I survived Hurricane Diana in uh, September 1984. Coast Buster? We'll save a comment on that one. All right. <laughs> What's the latest tonight? The weather's looking better and better, not only for us, but for the northeastern corner of the state, which is feeling sort of threatened by Diana this afternoon. We'll have that forecast for you right after this. It is warm and humid out there tonight. The skies are pretty clear, and tomorrow it's going to be hot and humid with a whole lot of sunshine. Now, we're going to talk about Diana one more time. It's now about 120 miles northeast of Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. It's way up here just off the Carolina coastline. It's at latitude 36.5 north, longitude 73.6 west, for those of you who have been tracking that storm. It is beginning to move toward the east-northeast at about 30 miles an hour. It's expected to turn in a more northeasterly direction than that tomorrow. If it gets out over that cooler water, that's going to lessen the potential threat to the New England states. It's going to also make that storm die down. The storm has to have heat and moisture to continue to thrive out there. So once it gets on up toward uh, cooler waters, it's going to kill it down considerably. There's another tropical storm in the uh, weather picture, Eduardo, way down here in the southwestern Gulf of Mexico. It hasn't done a whole lot yet, but it could strengthen. We have been in pretty good shape throughout the day today, 
to excellent shape considering the weather we had with Diana for those of you who are starting cleanup operations. Now looking at the other map, we have a cold front that's going to be coming our way over the next several hours, probably 24 to 36 hours. It's going to cause a chance of some shower activity in our area, especially in the inland counties, but it's a slight chance because this frontal system is weakening, weakening considerably, we'll only have about a 30% probability of a shower or a thunderstorm out of it. It is weak, but it is strong enough that it's going to bring us some cooler weather in behind it. We're going to see clear skies behind it and daytime highs probably will not get out of the 70s. We're going to have excellent outdoor weather for the next several days. So for those of you who are going to start your cleanup efforts, the weather's going to cooperate for that. Right now in our area, we're on the warm side at 73 degrees. That's 22 Celsius. The relative humidity is very high at 100%. The barometer at 29.91 inches. It's great to see that barometer going up. Winds are out of the southwest at only 7 miles an hour. Sunrise tomorrow morning at 6.55 and will set at 7.19. The ocean water temperature around 70 degrees. Next high tide at Johnny Mercer's Spirit Riceville Beach, 11.25 tomorrow morning. Next low tide about 5.38. Along the coast, we, uh, well, we just continued that gale warning, actually, but small craft is advised to remain in port until the winds and the rough seas subside. The ocean is still definitely not calm. Across the Carolinas, we're down to 69 degrees in Asheville, 77 in Charlotte, and in Fayetteville, 74 in Raleigh-Durham, 76 in Greensboro, 75 at Cape Hatter, 73 in Wilmington, 74 in Jacksonville, 75 in Florence, and 80 degrees in Myrtle Beach. We have a fine forecast tonight. Fair skies down to about 70 with a northwesterly wind at about 10 to 20. For tomorrow, a mostly sunny Saturday, a 30% chance of thunderstorms popping up inland around 90 degrees for a high, a typical late summer forecast. Southwesterly winds tomorrow at about 10. Tomorrow night, partly cloudy, breezy. It's going to turn cooler down to about 60, keeping a 30% probability of showers. Three days ahead, Sunday looks fantastic, partly cloudy, breezy, a 30% chance of a shower, only up to about 72 degrees. Monday and Tuesday, sunshine in the forecast, daytime highs in the 70s. It looks fantastic for the next few days. That's good, good news. Thank you much, Shirley. You have won our hearts the last few <laughs> days, believe me. Gene Motley will have some football scores for you when we come back. Gene, some people couldn't practice this week, but some did try to play tonight. That's right. In fact, uh, up in Bladen County, you know, considering all the humidity that we went through, there wasn't much of it, Steve, but what it was, to paraphrase Andy Griffith's old comic routine, was football. So despite a healthy little distance, paraphrasing again, we went where the football was, namely Clarkton going up against Whiteville. And yes, you can see plenty of bugs out tonight, folks, as it was a little bit humid up at uh, Clarkton High Field. That was uh, Gary Ezell on a one-yard touchdown run. That puts Whiteville up 21-8 uh, after the pass. Uh, a little bit later on, Ricky Mitchell hits Gerald Mills for uh, Clarkton here. Clarkton did manage to get a score a little bit later then on a nice touchdown pass play. Keith Hewitt hits Tim Southern to make it 27-8 after the score, 28-8. That's how it ended up. Looking at our scores for tonight, there aren't many of them, but uh, what we have are finals. Uh, Whiteville 34-8 over Clarkton. Derek Ezell and Roosevelt Colson better than 100 yards each. St. Paul's over East Bladen 14-6. Uh, Bladenboro Southwest Columbus 25-6. Down South Carolina way, Myrtle Beach over Sockasy 10-6. Conway is 3-0 as they rip Lawrence tonight 28-7. And it was Aner 14, North Myrtle Beach 7. Well, several baseball teams can keep the champagne on ice this weekend. The Detroit Tigers, the first team since the 1927 Yankees to lead the American League from opening day right to the end. Bet you didn't know that. Well, they can clinch it uh, this weekend against Toronto. While the Chicago Cubs can't nail it down, but they can sure nail it shut with the Mets. Davey Johnson's got to be feeling frustration this year. He felt a lot more in the sixth inning when Jody Davis ripped this grand slam home run. Steve, Cubs just ripped the Mets apart, and uh, Jody comes out a little bit later to tip his hat to the fans. You know, they appreciate that over on the old north side. Meanwhile, Rick Sutcliffe wins his 13th in a row, and he gets uh, the victory 7-1. Uh, to one. While out in, uh, deep in the heart of Texas, Arlington, Texas, Gary Ward got back at his old teammates a home run to put Texas on top 2-1. to one. A little bit later, Alan Bannister with an RBI scores Don Scott and uh, Larry Parrish uh, with another RBI as uh, Texas just rolled all over Minnesota. Final in that one was 9-2. to Elsewhere, Toronto keeps Detroit hold, held off for at least a couple more games, 7-2. The BJs win it tonight. Other scores, Baltimore blanking Milwaukee 2-0 in the third. The Yankees over Boston 7-1. 
All other American League action is out on the coast. Over in the National League, it was Chicago over the Mets. San Francisco shuts out Atlanta 3-zip as uh, they get three runs in the ninth inning. It was Los Angeles shading Cincinnati 6-5. They're tied 2-2 in the eighth between San Diego and Houston. And in other National League action, also in the eighth, Philadelphia bombing Montreal 9-4, while the Bucks and the Cards are all tied at 7-7 now in the eighth. Doubleheader of college football tomorrow here on TV3. Leading it off at noon, the North Carolina Tar Heels will open their season. That'll be against Navy. Coach Dick Crum seeing Kevin Anthony will start at quarterback, even though highly touted sophomore from Charlotte Mark May will be in the game, and I expect him to be in the game rather early. Among the national contests that will take place, uh, having not played a single down this season, Texas is the number one, uh, number three team in the nation. Tomorrow they'll be rematched against uh, Auburn and Bo Jackson. Auburn still smarting from that Miami loss. And certainly Coach Pat Dye has these guys all geared up for that contest. Pittsburgh will be looking to rebound from an opening game loss to BYU. Panthers will try and run Chuck Scales uh, at the uh, Oklahoma defense. The uh, Pittsburgh did get a run-oriented offense and a solid defense with uh, Bill Callahan uh, doing outstanding and picking off his Brigham Young pass despite the fact that they lost. Uh, Steve, you've already told me that you like uh, the uh, Pitt Panthers in this contest. I still want to go with Oklahoma, even though they aren't as powerful as they used to be. I think Switzer will come out with a big surprise. 3.30 tomorrow. Okay. We'll be back with a final look at Bald Head Island when we come back. Finally tonight, Bald Head Island sits unprotected from the elements southeast of Southport. Twice this week it was hit by Hurricane Diana. Although it's the most vulnerable area during the storm, several residents chose to remain on the island. Karen Marie has their story. Ballhead is a private island with 140 vacation homes and 20 permanent residents. When word came that a hurricane was coming, residents were asked to leave. We had a handful that, against our advice, stayed over and the, they shared the base of the lighthouse with the few members of our staff that we left here for security purposes. Polly Fish and her husband were among six people on Tuesday and 15 on Wednesday that wouldn't leave. So they spent two nights in the bottom of a lighthouse that was just next door. You could feel the wind. You could hear it in the lighthouse even swayed. And the old plaster from inside the lighthouse filtered through every floor. And it was wet in there. Winds reached upwards of 115 miles per hour. Yet Miss Fish claims that she was never scared. The safest place in Brunswick County, I guess. It's been there 160 years. One of the things they did to kill time while in the lighthouse was play with their pets. They took two dogs and four puppies with them, and when it was all over, the puppies had names. Wendy, Hurricane, Mariah, and Diana. Surprisingly, damage on the island is mostly minor. Some flooding, toppled cedar trees, and blown off shingles. Leaking windows was the only damage at the fish's home. And if you're wondering about the giant sea turtles that nest on the island, the word is, is that they're all right. Hurricane Diana was the first major hurricane since Hazel, and once again, Ballhead Island survived. Karen Marie, Eyewitness News 3, at Ballhead. Next on Nightline, you can see a look at music videos, not Hurricane Diana. A few final notes. Eckerd Drug at Longleaf Mall has 8,000 gallons of distilled water available for you if you need it. If there's a question whether you should use water in your house, they will be open 24 hours. So if you do need it, you can go by Longleaf Mall at Eckerd Drug for it. In answer to some phone calls in our newsroom, I do not know where you can get I Survived Hurricane Diana t-shirts. Mine was a gift from someone from the ABC television network. To all of you who have been with us this week, we're glad you made it through. Good night, and God bless you.